So Israel has occupied the West Bank since the late 60s. Uh, even this withdrawal from Gaza that they're always talking about is not, I mean, they control Gaza. And if anything, post withdrawal over a decade uh, gone, uh, the brutality and viciousness of Israeli crimes against Gaza have increased, whether we're talking about indiscriminate bombing campaigns by, you know, Olmert or Netanyahu governments or just the on, ongoing, uh, you know, as one Israeli general said several years ago, we're going to put Gaza on a diet. They have lack of food, lack of medicine, lack of, uh, you know, nutrition. David Cameron, former British PM, said it's an open air prison. You know, the, the absolute viciousness of Israeli policy is not controversial anywhere else in the world besides the United States. And frankly, becoming less so in parts of the United States as, you know, it, it just, the reality becomes harder and harder to deny. Now, that being said, along with that, the sort of, um, you know, the complexity of, of, you know, there's no left in Israel, really. I mean, there's a very marginalized actual peace movement. There's like a kind of genuine liberal party, Moretz, which scores very poorly. And really, the only major figure who's actually willing to criticize these policies is the former prime minister, Ehud Olmert, which sometimes he does quite effectively. Um, uh, so that being said, I mean, now we've somehow, I mean, Netanyahu, even under, you know, multiple very serious corruption charges. I mean, there's a lot of corruption in Israel, but some of these charges actually implicate, um, you know, trying to interfere with the free press, which does exist inside, you know, 67 borders. Um, he's negotiated yet another uh, coalition. He's neutralized another one of his prime, primary uh, political antagonists, though I would say, you know, Benny Gantz obviously doesn't have any substantive difference in terms of ending Israeli apartheid or the siege on Gaza or even the real democratic character of 67 borders Israel itself. So they're, they're making it formal. They're talking about annexing the West Bank. And, you know, what, especially as people have sort of increasingly accepted the reality of what Israel is and what that situation is, um, and as Israel has sort of jettisoned its leadership that is concerned about, you know, what some kind of liberals tiss tissing in the United States might think or, you know, the, or what the European Union might think, um, you know, Netanyahu doesn't care. So, so where are we? I mean, to begin with one point that you mentioned about sort of Israel's declining sort of uh, image in the West. One thing that Matt Dust uh, tweeted the other day was the Democratic majority for Israel uh, had a, an advert against Jamal Bowman, who was running against Elliot Engel, who was a you know very pro-Israeli member of Congress. And what was striking about the advert was it made no mention of Israel. It right. was about uh, uh, Jamal Bowman apparently 20 years ago having problems paying his taxes because, you know, America is a difficult country to live in. <laughs> right. It didn't mention Israel. It just it just uh, uh, class shamed him. Class <laughs> shamed. It was like, hey, wow, J Jamal Bowman, in addition to being a great educator, has problems that a vast majority of Americans can relate to, you know, whatever idiotic thinking that was. Anyways, you know, I, uh, yeah. one of the more insidious things I noticed, I mean, you know, it's difficult to tell people's ethnicity from the voice, but the voice were, uh, sounded like a black woman, which, you know, it just reminds me of how uh, right. PR, PR companies in Britain will have a Scot or a Northern English person do, do an advert because those are more trustworthy uh, voices for the target demographics that they're hitting for. So, you know, I think we're seeing, you know, the consensus on Israel uh, uh, breaking down in light of what's been happening over the last 20, 30 years. You know, it becomes increasingly difficult to blame everything on Ararat when he's been dead for, you know, more than a decade and a half, right? Uh, so we, uh, we, we've seen Israel come to this kind of difficult point, which, you know, is perhaps a point that it was always going to come to. You know, Israel uh, has since 1967 occupied, you know, most uh, of, you know, in fact, occupied all of this sort of historic mandate of Palestine, the West Bank. Uh, it's taken some te uh, territory from Syria, the Golan Heights and, and Gaza. And it's effectively administrated them as a temporary occupation. But how long is an occupation temporary? 
right? You know, like this thing has gone on for generations. People born in 1967, you know, these people are getting on in age quite a bit. So we're seeing, a, uh, we're seeing, and, and what's happened is uh, the possibility of a two-state solution has been increasingly undermined because Israel has followed a policy of settlement. You know, one can criticize the Palestinian movement for making political mistakes or engaging in, you know, act counterproductive activity. But I'm not really interested in criticizing the Palestinians when the key poison pill that has undermined the possibility of a two-state solution has been this expansion of settlements, which went on throughout the 1990s, which was this sort of golden age of the uh, peace process. Maybe the Palestinians should have, you know, accepted uh, certain agreements in the past, but that's 20 years ago now. We, we're now living in a different era. And, you know, there are now hundreds of thousands of Israelis, uh, Jewish Israelis living in the West Bank. And because of the political power they possess within the Israeli electoral system, they can't be discounted. So we have this situation where you have, you know, we do comparisons with apartheid, right? Now, uh, sometimes Americans are very, you know, loose in using sort of racial analogies that work in North America in other parts of the world. You know, the way that boundaries are constructed within the Israel-Palestine context are not so much between black and white, but are more like a Balkan nationalism based on sectarianism and things like that. But the mechanisms, that we look at yeah, in the, the, mechanisms. That, the mechanisms through which Israel is exercising control are very comparable to colonial administrations. And we've seen, you know, you, you can talk about South Africa, but we can talk about the United States, you know, where you have a, a, a group that is forced onto increasingly smaller parcels of land as land is sort of part, uh, handed out to, to the dominant group, which is, is uh, Israeli Jews in, in the Israeli uh, uh, context. So the material basis for a two-state solution, which may have been a possibility in the 90s, has now totally gone. And now Bibi Netanyahu, who has possessed this objective for a long time, this is not as if Bibi just came up with this. This has been, uh, I remember reading that, you know, Bibi uh, had a map of this some 20 years ago, I had a map of the West Bank with orange parts uh, uh, highlighting the settlements. And his, his saying on this was that, you know, one day, hopefully this will be all orange, right? right. So now sort of the sort of modus vivendi that's existed is that, you know, we've had this growing settlement, but these regions have not been incorporated into Israel proper. So we have this kind of limbo situation, which allows, you know, some, hope that there might be, you know, illusory hope that there might be a two-state solution. Bibi now is talking about making annexations. And it's not clear if they'll do, you know, maybe they'll go ahead, full ahead with this, maybe they won't. But annexing large Golden Valley, which aren't the biggest population centers, but they contain key natural resources. Water is a, a precious uh, and not only do they uh, plan to annex these territories in, uh, in, in, into Israel, Israel proper. And I'll tell you, why is this important? Well, because if you want to build in the occupied territories, there's a whole rigmarole of process that you have to go through, through the Ministry of Defense, through, um, you, know, you, you know, which can be slow. You annex it and Israel exercises sovereignty. These decisions are made locally, which allows quicker expansion and so on. So there's a whole bunch of things. You know, it's not like it's radically changing things on the ground, but it's formalizing a situation. It's formalizing the situation that's existed uh, for a long time. And in addition, it gives citizenship to those Palestinians who live in that uh, district as well. So it wants the land without the people, right? right. Well, now, and also, and I, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so you know, this is this is again put it in the framework of the global context. The Uyghurs, Kashmir, uh, you know, more military action in uh, the south of the Philippines. You know, right? Put it in Indonesia, the Indonesia. Put it in context of all this. This is the uh, uh, a greater consolidation of power, and you know, at the end of the day. You know, you go to the Israeli public, you know, like Benny Gantz, who's like, let's keep the status quo. Uh, that's not as attractive as moving forward and, and, and continuing this. Now, what I think is the uh, byproduct of this in the long term. And, you know, I, you know, many of my uh, Arab colleagues, uh, you know, 
uh, uh, pointing out this is the death of Israel. Now, I'm not so uh, optimistic that you were going to see like a massive, and uh, 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 just not to be misconstrued, I don't want Israel to die per se. But, um, but you you'd know, like it to become maybe a full democracy for I'd all. I'd like it to become a full... I don't think, you know, so, uh, I think Israel has the military power to keep this situation sustainable in the medium term. I don't think we're going to see changes in the short term. But in the long term, how sustainable is it to have this kind of situation where you have Israel effectively exercising sovereignty over this entire uh, territory, getting in a song and dance about actually, but these regions are governed by the Palestinians, while at the same time saying, oh, but they're historically... Uh, Jew, uh, uh, they're historically, uh, you know, Israeli territories anyway. How long is this sustainable for? And how long will it be before the Palestinians give up on two states and start demanding civil rights? I think one of the biggest, the biggest threat for Israel is not from violent Palestinian, or at least for the status quo in Israel. It's not from uh, uh, Palestinian violence or missiles being fired out. Those are, that's an impotent rage. The biggest threat is that the Palestinians will give up on this and begin demanding an equal seat in a unified state. And when that happens, I think we're going to see radical changes. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that is, and this is me being extremely pessimistic, although I think you're mostly right. One is that, you know, the apartheid analogies really start coming initially from uh Desmond Tutu, Ronnie Casarols, I mean, actual people who liberated South Africa. So I think that's important to, to remember. And of course, Nelson Mandela himself infamously saying on Ted Koppel in one of his, you know, at the town hall in Harlem, like, we're not going to be properly free as South Africans until the Palestinians are liberated. So, and then there's also the, the Jim Crow analogy, which particularly when you look at like, you know, different roads for settlers versus Palestinians and you know, this type and, you know, police standing by while, you know, Jewish settlers, you know, engage in acts of vandalism and terrorism. I mean, this is very, you know, the analogies get very, and, and actually, I think, you know, another one you could do is potentially in some ways the relationship between some of the settler parties and Likud and, and maybe also, uh, you know, imperfectly, but RSS and BJP in India. So there's a lot of, and, and I think that's kind of the point is that, you know, when South Africa was liberated, I mean, one, you did have, I mean, the ANC might be pound for pound the most brilliant and synthesizing liberation struggle in history, uh, you know, of many, particularly in Africa at that time. But the the leadership and the range of strategy they put together, as well as the amount of truly exceptional leaders they had really was just distinctive. I mean, um, but there was also, you know, one, you had uh, and this was a very positive side of having a power balance in the world. You had the Soviets actually backing the right side in a lot of these liberation struggles, including the African National Congress, as well as, you know, Sweden under Olaf Palm. And then by the time you got to, you know, the like, you know, companies like, uh, like Israel or like, you know, British mining companies saying we're going to, you know, sit down representatives from both sides that, you know, beautiful estates in the UK and negotiate a transition, it was clear which way the world was going. And, you know, I think the world is going in an opposite direction today. And some of the, you know, core intellectual infrastructure of this kind of new resurgent right, this new kind of, it's still pretty pseudo nationalism because these are still all hyper globalized uh, capitalist countries, but the increasing comfort with, you know, eliminationist and bigoted policies, um, not a healthy call to, you know, robust social safety nets and, you know, sort of healthy social democratic uh, national policies, but real, you know, vindictive nationalism is, is at an ascent. And I think, you know, Israel can look at that and say, you know, I mean, all of these tendencies that, you know, when Barack and Olmert said, we're going to be a pariah, well, you know, maybe we're in a pariah world now. I mean, I think that's, I think that's, you know, for all, you know, and I have plenty of criticisms for the liberal world order that people harken back to, but, you know, there was at least some pretext that they wanted to, you know, that they wouldn't go full out. You know, one of the things that the Trump administration has done, it's basically just said, take off the gloves. It's not like these things weren't happening before. To use an analogy, you know, 
the war against ISIS, you know, the Obama administration was fighting it. There was bombing and so on. And so there was the cost, but it was a much slower rate and less, you know, brutal than when Trump came to power. And it was just like, you know, do what you like. So now we're seeing that kind of acceleration. So, of course, these tendencies have existed for a while. It's not like before Modi came to power, Kashmir was the center of, you know, uh, uh, peace and stability. Most militarized place in the world. Exactly. And, you know, and now we're seeing conflict with China, you know, where Chinese and Indian soldiers are clashing with bamboo sticks and artillery on the boundary, which, you know, further destabilizes the situation. So, you know, things, you know, under the Obama administration were bad, but things can get worse and they are getting worse. And that's something you, you know, uh, key, key to understanding about the situation. We have to avoid nostalgia for, for a, a bygone era, which was never as great as people sort of want to make out to it. But let's also, as you say, let's avoid false equivalencies. You know, yes, there's corruption. You know, Hillary Clinton, you know, the Saudis weren't giving Hillary Clinton money because they cared about Haitian children. But, you know, that is a different thing f- from, you know, some of the naked transactionalism that is taking place now. I, I honestly have to say, I don't, you know, <laughs> in the Clinton's case, the, the Clintons get pretty damn close. But certainly, you know, uh, I mean, the, the simplest one really is, I mean, the Obama administration, absolute height of neoliberal decadence and corruption through the formal channels. But in terms of the the very naked give and take of Trump, I, actually night and day, in a way that the Clintons, I would say, are not, frankly. I mean, I there's mean, a lot of conspiracy theories about the Clintons and everything else, but they were much closer to that line than, than Obama was. Well, one of the things I think upsets people in DC, and this is just my personal take, is, is that Trump is kind of ruining the party because they were all able to do that corruption, not corruption, perfectly legally, right? right? Perfectly legally. Now Trump is like a bull in the China shop doing things which is bringing light to the, this kind of thing and kind of ruining the party for everybody because people are, you know, when, when Trump gets criticized, he often will, his, his uh, followers in the media will often raise legitimate points about, well, you know, you're complaining about this, why aren't you? Why weren't you complaining about it when this Obama administration official did this, or when Hillary Clinton did that, and so on and so forth? So I think you know part of it is because Trump is bad at doing the traditional corruption that DC is so used to and DC operates upon. Absolutely. Well, Gene Bajlan, as always, appreciate your time, brother. Stay safe. Stay strong. Uh, best wishes to everybody. Hey, you take care of yourself and have a wonderful day.